There's a lot of talk these days about returning to the moon and or manned flights to Mars. There are many bits and pieces online concerning every aspect, from the best engine choices to the dangers of radiation exposure endured by travelers. With all the YouTube experts out there, this is an assessment based upon what I've gleaned thus far. This analysis assumes that SpaceX will be successful in their stated goals for Starship, namely that a typical payload to low Earth orbit will be 150 metric tons with a payload space of 8 meters in diameter and 22 meters in length. Expendable or non-returning vehicles, they claim, may accommodate up to 250 tons. No starship has yet reached orbit, but amazingly, there's been little discussion of what such capacity this will enable. We know at first the Starlink will comprise the bulk of that cargo. It is Starlink that will drive the financing of Mr. Musk's goal of establishing settlements on Mars. For every Musk utterance, there seems to be a talented designer out there to create an amazing rendering of that vision. These include land and sea launch platforms, end-to-end -end or side-by-side -side orbital refueling rendezvous to landings on Mars or the Moon. Such scenarios show us graceful touchdowns in both places, but we need to brace ourselves for a rapid unscheduled disassembly of such vehicles regardless. Remember that several craft were sacrificed in development of the Falcon 9, Crew Dragon, and Starship before procedures were ironed out. Even then, the only successful Starship to land was serial number 15, and she was on fire at the time. Landing on the moon, where there is no atmosphere, will be different than landing on Starship on Earth. With 179 successful landings, or Falcon 9 boosters, there's a lot of experience there to go on. Though Starship and Super Heavy boosters are far more massive than Falcon 9, the physics is the same. On Earth, both may use the atmosphere to break the vehicle somewhat. On the moon, there will be no grid fins or flaps to slow or steer a Starship. One saving grace is that lunar gravity is one-sixth that of Earth. Regardless, Neil Armstrong's landing of the Eagle was a very close thing. Neil's set that lander down by flying it manually and with just enough fuel to get home. Thankfully, computer hardware and software have advanced significantly since then. The lack of atmosphere may even make the software less complex. We can only hope. As in the Apollo program, the most important decision may be where to land, not how. In no more important area is this than the access to water. In alignment with Dr. Robert Zubrin, the, long, the longtime advocate for the settlement of Mars, I would agree that the first substantial craft to set down must be unmanned. Even before that, robust communication and satellite positioning systems are required. Beyond exploratory rovers and helicopters, this means starships loaded with equipment and supplies. Such items will be nearly identical for the moon and require a minimum of the following. Power plants, modular habitats, including laboratories and machine shops, garden greenhouses, food supplies, equipment for water processing and extraction of minerals, surface vehicles, earth movers, and solar power generators. This is where the massive lift capability of Starship goes to work. Saturn V or Artemis are just not suited for payloads needed in sustained development. On top of that, they are expendable. Though in initial stages, some Starships may be left on the surface, repurposed or used for parts, namely engines. The ground facilities we can leave for another podcast. Important for both spacecraft and settlement is the heavy lift capability of Starship for future craft. For now, Starship will make 
many things possible which were unfathomable before. Not knowing the full engineering details, it seems unwise or unlikely that single starships will venture as far as Mars. There's simply no need to take such a risk. Payload capacity would indicate more substantial craft may now be assembled in low Earth orbit from multiple missions in the same way the ISS was built. Let's begin with engines. Getting from the surface to and from Earth, lunar or Mars orbit requires the power of chemical rockets. One alternative for launching cargo or human transport modules from the lunar surface could be electromagnetic propulsion via maglev tracks. Travel between orbits once attained does not need so much energy. In space, ion propulsion of various types makes the most sense. SpaceX currently employs hull thrusters for each satellite in the Starlink fleet. Such thrusters cannot bring a craft to orbit, but can easily move them between orbits. Such engines work by creating a plasma, which is then accelerated into space without combustion. This provides momentum for propelling the craft forward. Those thrusters used aboard satellites provide very little force and require a significant degree of electric power. They are small, light, efficient, and perfect for small orbital adjustments, but there are ways to mitigate such limitations. In terms of ion thrusters, the Hall effect is superior to versions requiring graphite grids, which will degrade over extended use. Limitations still exist in that ions may react with and etch the inner walls of the thruster. Replacing or repairing these should not constitute a great inconvenience. Thrust limitations may be countered by using an array of driver elements and increasing the magnetic field used for each. Marked efficiencies are noted by scaling up. Moving from a 100 millitesla field to a 400 millitesla field and from 75 kilowatts to 100 kilowatts, thrust increased from 2.1 newtons to 2.75 newtons, while efficiency doubled from 33% to 62%. Recent innovations in high temperature superconductor tapes or rare earth barium copper oxides may provide vast improvement. Power consumption drops by a factor of 300 weight drops by 400% and magnetic field increases 400%. Superconducting coils could be cooled by any of the cryogenic fuels used for propulsion in combination with standard refrigeration. The use of HTSC for thruster coils will vastly reduce their power requirements and increase thrust. Power is another area which is seldom discussed, but when it is available, it solves many problems. Mars orbits at approximately 1.9 astronomical units versus one for Earth. The inverse square law dictates that solar radiation is cut by nearly a factor of four. This means that a solar panel in Earth orbit generates four times as much power as the same panel in Mars orbit. Solar panels are a wonderful solution in areas where A, the sun shines, B, not too much power is needed, or C, little or no maintenance is required. NASA is developing kilopower units using sterling coolers combined with cores of uranium of low enrichment. They are compact and produce about 10 kilowatts each for several years. Such will be handy, but they will not provide the power required for settlement or reliable travel. The best solution is the thorium molten salt reactor. With Artemis, NASA wants to go back to the moon. Settling the moon makes sense in terms of establishing a point of departure for the rest of the solar system. Iron, oxygen, thorium, lithium, and other valuable resources are there. Thus far, water deposits are confined to polar regions and craters where the sun never shines. Reliance on solar power is not practical 
as the sun disappears for two weeks at a time. Unless an appreciable number of solar collectors and transmission cables are established, power will be difficult to manage. Needed water lies in holes, not seeing the sun for billions of years, if ever. That is where extraction and processing must happen if one wishes to use it on the sunny surface. Water, too, must be distributed. There are stirrings even at NASA and the Department of Energy that thorium could be the answer. A detailed analysis is in my podcast called Limitless Energy, Why Aren't We Using It? A detailed analysis is in my podcast called Limitless Energy, Why Aren't We Using It? Looking further into liquid fluoride thorium reactors reveals that research is ongoing regarding everything from small mobile modular reactors to regional power plants. A reactor the height of a man and three meters in diameter could produce 25 megawatts of power. An average household uses only 10 kilowatts. A reactor the size of a bus weighing 20 to 40 tons could produce hundreds of megawatts. This is the level of power needed to accelerate spacecraft to much higher velocities or provide power to Martian pioneers. Remember, the capacity of Starship will be more than enough to house a reactor and the much reduced fuel supply needed for hull thrusters. The size, weight, and efficiency for power supply and thrusters is so great that a redundancy of two or even three reactors or more fuel is possible. Spacecraft mount for Mars would consist of several modular pieces to be assembled in orbit. These would best be packaged as starships only to be used in space. These would include habitats, reactor plus fuel for ion thrusters and hardware needed to join them together. Both fission reactors and human passengers would benefit from artificial gravity. Even if completed interplanetary craft could cut the trip to six weeks, there's still additional time in orbit. In the beginning, it seems likely that humans would remain in orbit over Mars while directing robotic operations on the surface. A significant amount of time will be required in preparing habitats, power stations, and prospecting below. It is astonishing to me that the ISS program has not study how to build rotating habitat pods into the station to give astronauts a break from microgravity. For the reactors, a key safety feature is the draining of the fluoride salts containing fuel in case of overheating or malfunction. The salts are stopped by a solid plug of crystal until that cooling is removed. Then the crystal melts and the salt drains into a reservoir where it rapidly solidifies. This requires gravity or centrifugal force. So we can picture an axial structure with two or three starships docked perpendicular to it. These would be the reactor plus fuel combinations. Possibly the chemical engine section is jettisoned to save weight. Another group of two or three starships would make up supply and habitat sections. The permanent or semi-permanent modules would be docked to a spinning mount to provide artificial gravity. If not included previously, a starship or other lander for Mars could be available as a primary or a spare ship, perhaps on the central axis. Interplanetary spacecraft can be scaled up or down depending on requirements and capabilities. The abundance of power could operate a multitude of thrusters for positioning, module rotation, or accelerating the entire craft to high velocities needed for reducing time on trips to Mars or the asteroid belt. Astronauts or ordinary travelers would not need to endure the breakdown of their bodily tissues as a price for interplanetary travel or work in space. Rotating habitats could even be established on the moons of Earth and Mars, or asteroids where gravity is very slight. Another possible advantage of available power in quantity is shielding. 
Entering the atmosphere on Earth or Mars from orbit at high velocity generates a lot of heat. To date, this has been offset by a large single piece heat shield for capsules or multiple ceramic tiles used for the space shuttle and now for the Starship and Dream Chaser. When a craft enters the atmosphere at supersonic speed, a shock wave is generated forward of the direction of motion. High temperature plasma is not actually making contact with the vehicle, so heat is transmitted via radiation. It is here that the ship could essentially fight fire with fire. A superconducting coil or coils generating a high magnetic field could create a plasma emanating from the ship analogous to that of the Hall effect thruster. This plasma would push back against that generated on re-entry out away from the hull of the craft. Since radiation is the principal path for heat transfer, radiation levels could be vastly reduced due to the inverse square relationship. Electromagnetic radiation in the form of infrared in this case is reduced as one over R squared, where R is the distance between the hot plasma and the hull of the ship. Plasma generated on re-entry need not be pushed very far away before the energy density reaching the hull was significantly reduced. This could be a more reliable means than depending on thousands of ceramic tiles staying in place. Plasma shields generated by interplanetary spacecraft would greatly aid in reducing exposure of humans and cargo to cosmic rays. In interplanetary space, away from the Earth's protecting magnetic field, cosmic rays are in acute danger. These consist of X-ray and gamma radiation, along with charged particles moving at relativistic velocities. Such particles have so much energy that they will tear up DNA and other molecules inside of ourselves. Enough radiation in a short period of time can be fatal in significant amounts over time are a high cancer risk. As above, generation of outgoing plasma by a spacecraft, even at fairly low energies, would counter cosmic rays. Plasma generators are placed over the exterior of the ship at strategic locations to protect crews and equipment. It is said that Apollo crews between missions 16 and 17 dodged a bullet as that is when a significant coronal mass ejection erupted from the sun. This is by far the greatest danger. The sun is monitored now by several satellites, and the approach of such ejections could be relayed to crews in time to warn them. One of the best ways to shield against X or gamma rays is to surround delicate compartments with water jackets. NASA and Elon Musk are already addressing this, but the heavy lift capacity of Starship provides more headroom for this option. The idea of sending single Starships to Mars, even with a capacity of 150 tons, might still be on the edge of comfort. Such a journey would still require launching up to six anchor ships for refueling to get a ship there in the first place. Why not make those extra launches count by providing a much more efficient means of propulsion with greater cargo capacity and comfort and comfort? No doubt starships will travel to Mars and at first spend a couple of months in orbit. The risk for orbit only is not so great. As stated, the landings could be very touchy. The angry astronaut refers to them as Mars death dives. This likely goes too far in the opposite direction, but he has some good points. Some fancy calculations will need to be done to figure out an air braking plan for such a massive vehicle on Mars. Reconnaissance by robots should be done to pick out the best landing areas. Needless to say, the heavy lift capacity of Starship is truly a stepping stone to interplanetary travel and settlement.